Nobody's perfect. No programmer is perfect. And no program can ever be perfect. No matter how hard we try, programming errors have a way of escaping detection. And even when there are no errors, there still may be many things wrong with the program. But we can do a lot better than we have been doing, if we pay attention to what we are doing. Programs are made by people. Errors are made by people. So the things we must do is to look at the way people make programs and people make errors. Let's start by critically reading programs, so we can recognize what is good and bad in a program. Here's a piece from some sales analysis code that has been causing trouble ever since it was written. At a casual glance, it looks harmless enough, but it's typical of the rest of the code in this program, a program that hasn't worked right since the programmer quit two years ago. Let's try to read it critically to see where the troubles are. How can we read it? We don't know that language. Good point. Since this language is a mixture of COBOL and PL1 and several other languages, we're using this blended language to show that principles of well-structured programming are not language dependent and that reading programs is so much easier than writing them. You're right. I can read it. There's nothing there I really don't understand. Excellent. Then perhaps you can tell us what this code does. Well, how should I know? Sure, I can read the language, but how can I understand unless you tell me what the names stand for? Then you can't really read it, can you? By read, we mean read and understand. This is the first and perhaps most important principle of well-structured programming. Remember what we're trying to learn to do. We want to write correct programs, and we want to be able to modify them without going bankrupt. How can we do that if we don't understand them? It's probably the program that's at fault, not you. A good way to start reading a program we don't understand is the way you suggested. Try to figure out what the names mean. Try to guess, just to get started. Hmm. Retails, retains, retaliates, retracts. Return. It might mean returns, but that's only a guess. It happens to be a good guess. But why should we have to guess? What could the programmer have done to make this program better structured, less guessing for us? He could have called it returns like this. And probably he meant the OR in ORFL and BKOR to mean orders, since this is a sales analysis. Very good guessing. You see, even in a poor program, a little bit of consistency gives us a good clue. We assume he meant the same thing by OR in both places. At least we hope he was consistent. But he wasn't that consistent. First there was ORFL, then BKOR. He should have used O-R-F-L for filled orders, I suppose, and B-K-O-R, which is probably for back orders. You're beginning to learn how to read critically. Mysterious symbols like O-R-F-L are just not understandable. Maybe we can't always use natural symbols, but I'll bet you can beat these symbols. But what is natural? One good way of telling is by listening to how we talk. A little while ago, you said filled orders and back orders. So why don't we use those terms? Watch. It's getting easier to understand but I still don't understand the whole thing. RR is a complete mystery to me. RR, hmm. Sometimes, when we can't get it right away, try adding some structure. What do you mean, add some structure? For example, parentheses give structure. 
Let's take that part in parentheses as though it were a separate structure. I get it. That's net orders. The difference between the orders they got and the stuff that was returned. Right. The programmer could have simplified our job in understanding this formula by introducing as an extra structure net orders. How's that? Better. RR is the percentage of returns. Maybe it stood for returns ratio. Excellent, but slow down. Why are we restructuring this code anyway? Because it's bad, that's why. So then, why should we be misled? Returns ratio isn't all that bad, but isn't it more natural to say... Percentage of return. Better, but we're in no hurry. A few seconds now will save hours for someone later on who has to understand the code. We don't want to mislead anyone by our poor choices either. Is it really percentage of returns? Hmm, I get it. It's really proportion or fraction. To be a percentage, it would have to be multiplied by 100. So we should call it fraction of returns. Hey, can I do it this time? Sure, go ahead. That looks better. It's always better when you take the time and trouble, not really very much extra trouble, to be precise. So let's be sure we're sustaining our effort by making doubly sure we change RR in each and every place it appears. It's my turn. There's one. And there's another. So that's really quite a bit we've accomplished. Just by taking the time to use really natural names. Now, can we read it and really understand it? He's going to do something if the fraction of returns is less than 0 0.20 and something else if it's less than 0.33. Slow down. Is that really a precise statement? Sure it is. Just look at the program. You look at it. It doesn't say less than. It says less than or equal to. Hmm. So I misread it. What's wrong with that? Well, nothing's wrong with you. Remember, criticize the program, not the people. Why did you read it wrong? Why? Oh, I see. The first test was less than, but the second is slightly different. And why is it different? That's what a structured programmer should ask. I can't see any reason. It's confusing because they're so similar, but it has to be that way. Sometimes program logic is just confusing. At least, to me, it is. I'll agree that program logic must sometimes be confusing. But that's all the more reason it shouldn't be unnecessarily confusing. So let's just make them both less than. Hey, you can't do that. Why not? Because it changes the meaning of the program. Do you really think so? Where do you think that number 0.33 came from? Oh, it's probably an approximation for one third. So it looks precise because it's said or equal to, but it's only an approximation. We should be precise, but not when the precision isn't warranted. Otherwise, we make reading just that much harder. Spurious precision like this can only be understood by the original author. To us, it raises questions we can't easily answer. Therefore, one of our most important structured programming principles is simply not to create difficult questions. You're right. Programming's hard enough. He should have left it like this. So we agree on that. But let's remember our principle and not be misled by poor original choices. Let's slow down back to what someone said a while ago. He's going to do something if the fraction of returns is less than 0.20. How would you make that more precise? Hmm. He's going to make a branch right here to end of analysis. Of course, it doesn't show what happens when he gets there. But you see, branching isn't doing anything at all. That go-to statement isn't doing any processing. It's just a control statement, a way of stringing together parts of the program. But it is doing something. It's bypassing all this code. Oh, come on. When I bypass going to work, am I doing something? It's not doing a thing. Well, but that's the program fooling us again by creating difficult questions. It seems to be doing something if you don't read carefully. 
If you want to see that it isn't doing anything, you have to look in several places. So the question is doubly hard, even when we know that the answer is doing nothing. We can hardly consider this kind of coding well-structured, can we? But he has to do it that way, branching around the other code. That's just the way programming is. Is, maybe, but has to be never. What other ways can we write this logic? Hey, where's everybody going? Uh, to get our flow diagramming templates. Come back. If you need a flow diagram for a tiny piece of program like this, your approach can't be well structured. The first step to cutting down that kind of tangled logic is to get rid of things we don't have to look at. Like those first two lines, now that we know what they do. Their job is to provide fraction of returns for later use, so we can concentrate on the what rather than the how. That way, we only have to think about the smallest possible area at a time. Which is hard enough for me. Don't apologize. Nobody uses his brain more than necessary. Of course, we must have those two lines in the program, but a blank line would have helped. Beautiful. I wish I'd done that. Just that little gap in there tells us that this is one part, and that's another. This does one thing, that does something else. I wish I could do that color trick, but I guess the blank space will do the job in my programs. Which is exactly what we mean by decomposition. We bring a big problem to manageable size by breaking it into two or more small problems. Divide and conquer is one of the most powerful principles of structured programming. It sure helped me there. But just because it's so powerful, we must be careful not to abuse it. For instance, we shouldn't stick in blank lines willy-nilly, but only when they indicate a clean separation into functionally distinct parts. But how do we know where to make that separation? Sometimes that decision can be very hard, yet it's often easy to see where not to make a separation. First, Let's test our first decomposition by erasing the first two lines. Does that bother anybody? Nope. Me neither. Then suppose we insert a blank line here. Hey, don't do that. Why not? Because those two lines belong together. I mean, they're what you do if the fraction of returns isn't less than 0.33. And how do you know that? Because there's a comma, not a period, after the first line. That means they go together. Hey, I didn't notice that. Neither did I until we tried to separate them with the blank line. That's an important lesson then. Even though the computer picks up those little details, we just aren't built that way. The program would be easier to read if we could emphasize the tiny differences in some way. We could indent that part like this. I sometimes do that in my programs. But it worries me that you say sometimes. Just when do you do it? Well, whenever I think of it, if I'm not in too much of a hurry. That's not structured programming. Right. If indenting is worth doing, it's worth doing it systematically and consistently. It's such a bore. Not if you understand why you're doing it. I agree that arbitrary and mindless rules are a bore. And when we're bored, we're bad programmers. But in this case, there's a very good reason to indent. Because my eyes aren't as sharp as a computer's. Then why don't we move that label, end of analysis, over like this? In COBOL, you have to start labels over there. But in this funny language, there's just that little colon. But just because the language doesn't require the labels to stick out, that doesn't mean we can't adopt a style. A consistent style can make us do the same thing with good reason, like this. If you don't want to be bored, learn a style and improve your working conditions. That's for sure. Before you rush to make the label stick out, think about why you want to do that. That's obvious. It's easier to find where the go-to went to. And if you didn't have a go-to? You won't catch us with that theory. We know you're going to tell us that structured programming means no more go-tos. Well, that's a nice theory, but sometimes you need a go-to. How about now? I guess not. It would have been easier and smarter if he had used indentation as we did. What would he have seen? That he could have reversed that test, making it greater than. Now, you see, it's expressed in terms of when to do something, rather than when to do nothing. 
So we no longer need that do-nothing statement. Zap it. Take that. Hey, don't do that. Why not? Well, because it doesn't work now, that's why. The first period ends the part covered by the test. You really are reading critically. Any program that's wrong certainly can't be well-structured, can it? But you all see what went wrong with our nice plan? I get it. It's just like with the colon in reverse. Just because we indent things doesn't mean the computer will read them that way. The computer only sees the period. It's a shame, isn't it, that our language won't let the computer read our indentation. But that can't be helped. Still, it's an important principle of structured programming that we shouldn't worry too much too early about language details. Otherwise, we don't program, but just code lots of details. That's so obvious, but yet so important. I've got to get going, but not if there's still an error. I'll get it. Just take out the period and put in an else. Good. The else is another example of a little extra structure that helps us out. It shows that these two parts are alternatives, depending on how the test comes out. I see. That's much better. OK. Then let's stop for a while and review. You've given us a lot of new things to think about. Thank you. Most of the credit is yours. I've just reminded you of some old things that we tend to keep forgetting to put into practice. We've done very little in one sense, but we've come a long way from the original program. Remember? Yes, it was a mess. Why is it better now? What did we do? We used names that made things clear. And we used a decomposable structure. I guess you could say we learned to think about what we were doing and why. You know, the most important lesson is that the original programmer could have done all this himself and saved us the trouble. Doing it right takes a lot less time than doing it over. All you have to do is read your own work critically as we've just done. We could read each other's work. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's much like the golden rule. If you read programs critically when you get a chance, apply some of the ideas we've covered and use tact with personal criticisms, you and your colleagues will be a lot more successful, and so will your program.